1995, uh, a guy named Timothy McVeigh <clears throat> blew up a federal building in Oklahoma City. He planted a truck filled with fertilizer, explosives, outside of the building. Nine o'clock in the morning, he, he blew it up. McVeigh was a, a white nationalist, or at least a far-right um, extremist, who was angry about a couple things. At least he claimed that his, his reasoning for blowing up the building was his anger about Waco. If you know anything about what happened in Waco and Ruby Ridge. And he wanted to send a message. And he had been associating and spending a lot of his time with alt-right, far-right, militia, white nationalists, white supremacists, neo-Nazi, um, clan even, groups. And these groups have existed forever, for a long time, under the surface, right? Under sort of behind the scenes. And one of the horrible things about Oklahoma City was where he parked the truck was right outside of a daycare in the building. And the truck, you know, destroyed a massive chunk of the building and the building collapsed. But it just demolished, it just slaughtered the children that were in this daycare. And I think that was the big takeaway. You know, over 100 people, 168 people died in the Oklahoma City bombing. But the fact that it was children in a daycare, babies, two-year-olds, and even the office workers in the building, they weren't ATF, they weren't FBI, they were just office bureaucrats, government employees going about their day. And so if his intention was to start a revolution or cause chaos, and get people following in his footsteps, it didn't work because of the outrage of the death of these people, especially these children. And I don't want to shock people or make it horrible to listen to this, but you know, what happened to these people in the daycare, especially like there was a plate glass window and they were shredded, you know, scalped, brains falling out of skulls, babies torn limb from limb. This isn't clean, this isn't anything that anybody ever wants to imagine. Anyways, <clears throat> after Oklahoma City, the white nationalist, the, the far-right extremist, homegrown terrorist sort of movement went into hiding, essentially. They were, you know, they were public enemy number one. And so time went on. I was 95. What's the next big thing that happens in American history? Uh, a local terrorist attack. 9-11, huge, right? And whatever your thoughts on 9-11 are, you know, I believe it was um, Saudis and, and I believe the, the official story for 9-11 for the most part. But the anger shifted. Public enemy number one's now Muslim terrorists, Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, right? And a lot of these guys even, you know, the American military was going off to Afghanistan and Iraq, and a lot of these guys who were already these extreme alt-right, you know, some of them joined the military, that certainly spreads pervasively through the military. That uh, There's a lot of guys who like weapons, they like the ability to kill people, they like the sense of power, so they become military guys, and they get more training, they get more experience, and they were justified probably in their anger at the time, um, but it wasn't like that they were like, weren't like that before 9-11. But anyways, the focus was on the Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan. And so for a long time, again, these far-right groups sat under the surface. We didn't hear about them a whole lot. And there's been pockets here and there that have, you know, little things have happened. And then in 2008, a black man ran for president. And he did really well. And next thing you know, he's, he's winning the presidency. And that was too much for a lot of people. Uh, how dare a black man become president? How dare uh, a black man have ideas and influence policy, and put bills in place? And so you started to see the rise again of these extremists. The worst thing that could have possibly happened to them, right, is a black man in power. And you even saw guys who weren't necessarily alt-right extremists, far-right extremists, but they were racists, they were horrible people, Donald Trump being one of them, couldn't handle the idea that Barack Obama was the president 
and he started the whole birther movement and he's proclaiming that Barack Obama wasn't born in the United States. No evidence, right? Um, I remember following Donald Trump's tweets back in 2010, 2008, and the anger that he had that how dare a black man. You could see it, you could see it, right? It wasn't, it wasn't subtle. So Obama wins a second term. These people under the surface, and you saw the rise of the Tea Party movement, some nut jobs who sort of fit into that mold, getting more power in the government. And the writing was on the wall. And then in 2016 or 2015, when uh, Trump started the, the Trump campaign, I guess that was probably late 2014 actually, but Trump wins power in 2016. And a lot of people claim, oh, it was because people were disenfranchised. People were upset with the way um, the government was being handled. That, pay, that played a part into it for sure, but I think there was even more anger than you had these people who were, for eight years, bitter and angry about the black man being president. You had people bitter and angry about, you know, resentments going all the way back to Waco and Ruby Ridge and whatever happened to Oklahoma City and even before that. So you had angry people all over the place um, that had been laying dormant under the surface. And then you have this man that runs for president who says the dog whistle things and subtle things that you want to hear. He starts calling Mexicans rapists. His big focus is on uh, immigration, you know, anti-immigration. We're going to build the wall. We're going to, we're going to keep these brown people out of our country. Um, he's got a history of anti-black people rhetoric. So if you look it up, these people can see, hey, we got a guy here that, that thinks like us. And Donald Trump, he... He wins the election. I think the other factor was a lot of people were never going to vote for Hillary Clinton because she was a woman. So almost as bad as a black man as a woman to these people. And Hillary Clinton's not super likable. You know, she, she doesn't have that charisma. She doesn't have that quality that makes a lot of people really respond to her. So, but I would say that more so, it was just a lot of people weren't going to vote for a woman. And then guess what? There's this guy, Donald Trump, that kind of talks like us and he thinks like us. And so not everybody who's a Trump supporter, especially in 2016, is a Nazi or a racist or a fascist, but he attracted that demographic. And that demographic is bigger than I think any of us realized. And I look back to history. You look back to Hitler, how Hitler came to power. And I'm not comparing Donald Trump is not equal to Hitler, but they are very similar in the way they they launched their campaigns, the way that they took power, and then what they did with that power. Hitler, you know, Germany was in a really rough state after World War I, and the sanctions and all the, the rules that had been placed on them at the Treaty of Versailles, they lost the war and then they got the shit end of the deal. Then the Great Depression happened, so the country's in shambles, and you got a guy like Hitler, an angry dude who's extreme in his views, who's yelling about it's somebody else's fault. It's all somebody else's fault, and it's a visible minority. We can point to Jews. We can point to communists. It's their fault that the country is the way it is, and I'm going to make Germany great again. And he comes in, and he kind of does that. He starts investing in the economy, you know, and he gets these people where, on the surface, Germany is starting to boom. They reinvest in their military. They build their country into something they can be proud of again, you know, from a, an outward perspective. But behind the scenes, what you don't see is the treatment of the people and the horrible things that are going on um, for, for Jews and for communists. And people kind of just turn a blind eye because, hey, things are okay for me. Things are okay. The economy's good. I'm making money again. But when their neighbors, when the Jewish store owners next door or when, you know, a communist newspaper writer or whatever start disappearing or getting their businesses closed, it's like, oh... That's, that's too bad. And the only reason I'm giving this little background is just because we saw something similar with Trump. We saw point the finger at immigrants, point the finger at Muslims. What was the first thing he did when he took power? Muslim ban. He banned all these Muslim countries from coming into the United States. Ironically, it was under the pretext that they were going to be terrorists. But the countries that actually had had terrorists come into the United States in the last 20 years weren't part of that ban. So, hmm. Then it was the whole wall thing and just the continued rhetoric that Mexicans are, are bad and rapists and awful people, right? And then it was the blame on the, the left. It's 
you're going to be communist, you're socialist. Any media who wrote anything bad about him, fake news. Um, anybody who challenged him or questioned him was either fired from his administration or was branded as a, as a, a liar or you can't trust the mainstream media, you can't trust fake news, you can't trust stories. And so that's why we've seen so many people who have dropped out of paying attention to mainstream news because they think it's, it's all biased. You know what, of course there's a bias, but there's still standards in news. There's still a need to uh, get your facts straight. And if you don't, there's, there's serious implications if you, if you get that wrong. And so when people say, oh, you can't trust anything you read in the news, bullshit. You have to be able to trust what you read in the news because if they, you're going to get some slant in your information for sure. There is a bias, but it is factual. And if it's in fact, if it's not factual, there's retractions made. There's, there's still a big process when errors occur, at least in legit news organizations. The organizations that are Trump's propaganda mouthpieces don't have those. They do not have those um, rules in place to prevent false information. So they can essentially say whatever they want and they go under um, the pretext that, well, we're not actually a news organization. Fox News, we're an ent uh, entertainment organization. So we don't have to abide by standard journalistic practices. Regardless, you got Trump sowing discord amongst all these people in the United States against anybody who he perceives as an enemy. And it's Hitler's playbook. Anybody who doesn't agree with me, anybody who doesn't think like me is the bad guy. And so one of the things I heard from people that I'm, you know, that I know who gave Donald Trump the benefit of the doubt and who would say, well, he's not so bad. You know, he, he's done some bad things, sure. And they're not paying attention because again, they're not generally reading all the bad things he's doing. So they're only hearing bits and pieces. But they're, they're always making the claim that, but look at what he's done for the economy. The United States is doing so well. And the economy affects us in Canada, affects us and affects our businesses. So, hey, I'm all for it. You know, deregulation. Look at all the stuff he's done for deregulation. What you don't realize about deregulation is there's a reason those regulations are in place. There's a reason why you shouldn't be dumping toxic waste in rivers or using asbestos to line buildings or things like that. And yeah, initially, it allows businesses to make more money because they can cut corners and they can do things the wrong way and they can save, they can save big time, right? So of course, the economy is going to grow a little bit, but you're poisoning your country, you're poisoning your people by allowing that. You're opening up federal land, you're opening up na national monuments to exploitation by corporations. That's not good. You're pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords because, why? Because Obama uh, signed up for it. That's the biggest motivation that Trump had was to undo anything Barack Obama did. It didn't matter if it was good or bad or not. He just didn't want anything that was Obama's legacy to exist. So he pulls out of the Paris Climate Accords. He pulls, he's trying, especially in his first few years, he tried so hard to repeal the Affordable uh, Care Act, Obamacare. And what is that? That's health care for people who need it. That millions and millions of people, if you repeal Obamacare, don't have health care anymore. And many of them are going to die. And Donald Trump didn't come in and say, well, I don't like certain things about Obamacare, so I'm going to uh, modify it or change it and make it work in the way I want to see it. No, it's just, I'm going to take it away. And then somewhere down the road, we're going to do something about it. We'll, we'll replace it. But that's not what he, you know, Donald Trump, he doesn't do shit. He just wants to take away. He wants to put the stamp on it and say, I, I took away Obamacare because I fucking hate Barack Obama. And thankfully that didn't happen, but he tried. That was his big focus was take away healthcare, build a wall that is pointless because you know people, who, especially the bad guys who want to get into the country, they're still gonna get into the country regardless of whether there's a wall there or not. So spend billions of dollars on a useless wall, repeal healthcare, deregulate business, the economy, deregulate business. The economy was already booming under Obama. It was continuing to grow. So Trump inherits a good economy and then he, says it's all on him, you know, it's, it's, I did this, I did this. And then, yeah, we get to where we are today. And so under Trump, the whole time that Trump rose to power and then took power, those people, those Timothy McVeigh, those Oklahoma City terrorists, local terrorists, because you don't think McVeigh was the guy who did it alone, you know, only him and Terry Nichols went to jail for it, but there was many other people who were involved in that, right? And people like those people have been sitting under the surface for years, and then they get a president who supports them, who tells them that they're okay. Charlottesville, there are good people on both sides. There are not good people on a Nazi side, but Donald Trump says that, right? And so you start to see the public, um, the, the, the ability to show in public that I'm, 
I'm a Nazi. You know, you see marches with people with swastikas and SS and Totenkopf skulls and whatever, um, Confederate flags, all the shit that we thought was stupid and, and that people didn't do anymore or we didn't see as much. They're now marching down Main Street because they feel empowered to do that because of a guy like Donald Trump. And so those people who that I know that say, well, you know, he's done good things for the economy, so I'm gonna, I think he's okay. You're selling your soul. You're selling your soul. You're siding with a guy who supports Nazis because you think he's doing good things for business. I understand people who have conservative values. That's fine. You know what? But you don't have to sell your soul to the devil to get a, a world that, you know, where you can be successful as a business owner or you can be successful, um, maybe pay less taxes or whatever it is that you believe in, you do not have to sell your soul to the devil. And that's what these people have done. And then you have the people who have long ago sold their soul to the devil who have already become Nazis, who have already become racists, clansmen, or whatever. And they are emboldened and they keep growing. They keep pulling more and more people into their way. Then you get the election, right? So we come to November this year. And Trump loses the election. And he can't handle that because he's a fucking narcissist. And he can't handle the idea that he could possibly lose. So instead of conceding, he starts making up fake stories that, oh, there was election fraud. And he gets these sycophants, Rudy Giuliani and these other idiots, to go with his completely made up story that there was election fraud. There was no election fraud. He lost fair and square. It's like playing a hockey game and saying, well, I couldn't lose because I scored four goals. And then you ask, well, what did the other team score? Well, it doesn't matter. And you look at the score and the other team scored five goals. And you say, well, then you did lose because the other team scored more goals than you. And that's the whole, that's the whole nature of sport. Well, no, because how could I lose? I scored four goals. You can't argue with that. You can't argue. There's no logic. There's no rationale there. So he starts getting these people who aren't reading anything other than his propaganda that, guess what? You lost... You had an election stolen from you. Your votes don't count. And of course they're angry. They're already angry. They're angry. They've been angry for decades. But you rally them up. You get them believing that they're going to be patriots. They're going to take back their country. And so they go and they storm the Capitol building to try to stop the certification of those electoral votes. Is that, I guess, what the plan was? I don't quite know. You know, you got guys going in there with zip ties. You got guys going in there with guns and tasers. And what was their plan? They breached the building. They pushed past security. Had they actually gotten into the, uh, the Congress hall or wherever all those congressmen and senators were when, you know, when they were in the middle of doing what they were doing, what was their plan? Were they going to start executing people? And the scary part is all it takes is one person. All it takes is one nut job who's gone that far, who gets there, who's that angry. You know, their bitter hatred of somebody like Nancy Pelosi or some of the... Uh, you know, can you imagine what would have happened if some of these guys got Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez alone? Bad things would have happened to somebody like that because they hate these women especially, but they hate these people, people they deem liberals or leftists or socialists or whatever. So you get one nut job who starts shooting, he starts executing, and you've got a massacre in Congress. They were mad enough too at Republicans. They wanted to hang Mike Pence. They wanted to hang... You know, um, anybody who went against what Trump was saying. So my God, what could have happened? And you know what the scary part is? We're not past it. They shut down that one. Thankfully, you know, a couple people died. A cop died and a couple of the protesters died. But it could have been a much worse. But we're not done yet. You know, Joe Biden's going to be inaugurated in, in a few days. And on the 20th. And they're already having to make plans to probably not have Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, and Nancy Pelosi in the same location under fear that a terrorist attack happens on these people and they need succession plan. They need somebody to take over the government if both, you know, let's say Biden and, and Harris were killed. It's insane that they actually have to even do that, but they do and it makes sense. And that's where we are. And the reason we're here is because of fucking Donald Trump. Because Donald Trump has emboldened those nut jobs that, that want chaos. They want the world to be a Christian theocracy where white people have all the power, women, have no power. Black people, people of color have no power. You know, homosexuals, um, transgender people, anybody who's different than them has no equality, no say in the world. And we're supporting a man. We have people, I know people who stand by a man who wants that. And I can't handle it. I can't handle it anymore. So I'm sorry for the 15 minute rant, but I can't take this anymore. I am so frustrated. And 
I hope somebody listens to this. I don't know if anybody will. You know, I'm rambling on here, but I hope somebody listens and says, you know what, if I have somebody in my life who is still defending people like Donald Trump or people who support Donald Trump at this point, I understand if it was four years ago or even two years ago, but at this point in 2021, if you still know people who are making excuses for this shit, you gotta cut them out. You gotta start by trying to change their minds, but if you can't, cut them out. Show them that they don't belong in this society. They need to change their opinions. You know, we talk about a matter of opinion. Oh, everybody's opinion is worthwhile. A Nazi's opinion is not worthwhile. It doesn't matter how you swing it. If you say, oh, you know what, I'm okay with what Hitler did. Your opinion is not worthwhile. If you say, oh, I'm okay now with what Donald Trump is doing. Your opinion is not worthwhile. And you can go fuck yourself.